people see my screen? Do people see my screen? The cat? Yeah. We see your cat. We see Fredo. We a cat and a house. <laughs> Fredo is sitting on my daughter's dollhouse. Is that Fredo? Is it as in um, the brother? Uh, yeah. In, in fact, he's he's we he's a uh, his litter mate, who's uh, also our cat, is uh, Santino. Or, or maybe Michael. No, Santino and Fredo. Who's Santino? Sonny. The oh, that's brother. okay. Yeah. I, oh, Sonny. Oh, yeah. Sonny oh, Corleone. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one that got killed. Yes, on the on the causeway. Yep, exactly. Yeah, with the. Oh, yeah. you going Godfather on us, huh? Don't you? Yeah. Well, I think it's fitting. Okay. Oops. Let me get to the top here. Okay. Very good. So, um, I want to talk in some detail about uh, the sixth king, Servius Tullius, uh, who's uh, known uh, in the sources as the second founder of Rome. And uh, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, and uh, I'm hoping during the course of this presentation to give you some idea uh, of how Rome actually worked. So um, the, the historians, when they talk about Rome, they describe Rome as being this combination of being on the one hand, extremely conservative society and at the same time an extremely flexible and innovative society so how can those two opposites live at the same time uh, in one place uh, and so i'm going to try to give you some feeling about how that actually worked and some feeling of what kind of what was the the composition of the the roman body body politic um just some comments following on to Greg's presentation, it's interesting to note that really all of the Roman kings were outsiders. They were not Romans, they came from outside. And there was, they were not, uh, there was no hereditary principle at all. It seemed like they were elected. Uh, and um, in many cases, the later kings uh, were hostile to the aristocracy. And it was the aristocrats that overthrew the final king. Uh, and it was much more of a coup d'etat than it was a revolution. Uh, and one of the uh, um, provisions of after this, this occurred, uh, they went to the people and demanded that they swear that they would never allow another, never allow another king to rule at Rome. And the kings uh, were always associated with support for the common people. Uh, against the aristocrats. And in later times, whenever you would have a really popular politician, the aristocrats would accuse him of wanting to become another king. Uh, it happened many times, lastly, with, with Julius Caesar. Uh, and so this idea that the kings were always associated with support for uh, the common people was a, an interesting fact and an interesting factor of Roman kingship. So Servius Tullius is uh, known for a, a few major uh, achievements in the, in the sources. Um, he's known most of all for his reorganization of the citizen body. And I'm gonna talk in, in really some detail about that. Also the construction of temples, public buildings, fortifications, uh, important innovative initiatives in international affairs, and um, a change in the nature of kingship, uh, in particular in his reliance on popular support. Um, I'm relying very much on this book called The Beginnings of Rome by T.J. Cornell. Um, it's a, a major scholarly work uh, and um, rather than and I must confess that I, my presentation is going to be rather one-sided. It's, it's really almost entirely based on this book. 
Uh, and that's really because I've been spending a lot of time studying this book. Uh, and he's got a lot of really interesting things to say about this period. Um, this is uh, a, a quote. Now let me just see if I can get this thing to go away. Very good. Uh, this is a quote by Mary Beard, who many people who are interested in this period would be familiar with her, um, in which uh, she uh, talks about his approach for integrating uh, archaeology and history. And she says it's almost bound to become a standard textbook. I actually disagree with the, her there because this book is very argumentative and he's uh, bringing forward a lot of controversial theories that, that uh, are uh, in distinction in opposition to a lot of other scholars. And that sort of stuff doesn't usually make it in textbooks. Textbooks kind of aim to present a consensus view. Uh, but uh, this book is widely cited now by the, the leading historians of Rome, and it's a very influential book. So the first thing, and a lot of people in this discussion asked, how do we know anything about ancient Rome? And the, the first aspect of this is archaeological evidence. And so uh, on the left, we have something called the 13 altars, um, which uh, were uh, in the uh, sources, they talk about how the 13 Latin tribes had some common places for religious observance, which kind of uh, represented uh, a commonwealth or at least a, a, a common notion of the identity of the Latin people. And then these 13 altars were unearthed, which uh, kind of gives some credence to the sources. Uh, and the comment that I'll make on that is that the, the, the scholarly approach to the sources is the, and which dates back to Theodore Momsen, who was the, essentially the founder of modern Roman studies, uh, is that when the the sources talk about institutions that it's very often true that those are historical when they talk about individuals very much less so so this institution of uh of um shared cult status to create uh a, a common latin identity and then finding confirmation for that in the archaeological record on the right is a, a gold bowl, uh, which was uh, excavated from graves. So uh, the major source of archaeological material are graves, especially from this period. Uh, and at around in the in the uh, seventh century, in the six hundreds, archaeologists start to see very rich graves, they called them princely graves. Before that, they had been very kind of mundane. And they, uh, archaeologists and historians, take this to show the rise of an aristocracy. In other words, you have a small number of graves that are hugely filled with rich objects, gold objects, imported objects, uh, showing that, that real hierarch hierarchies and, and inequalities have developed in the society, which shows the development of a more advanced society, a, a stratified society. And it also shows, in this case, the tremendous influence of the Greeks. So if we look at this bowl over here, it's found, it's in the Museum Giuliana in Rome now. Uh, and you can see that it is very much like a geometric period Greek pot. It's divided into uh, these bands that are called registers. And on the registers are these uh, recurring uh, um, uh, identical uh, images. The figures are, don't have individuality and so forth. Uh, and the only thing that's unusual about it is that it's made of gold uh, and not of um, uh, you know, uh, painted clay. Um, so, well, it can be also very Greek. I mean, very uh, Egyptian too. The bands and the profiles and well, you can really find uh, uh, geometric Greek art that has almost exactly the same images, and I don't think it's true of the of of the uh, of the Egyptians. 
Um, okay, so the the second major source are um, epigraphical evidence. So um, epigraphical evidence means ancient inscriptions, ancient writing, and it's typically inscriptions like we see here and uh, things like coins. Um, so the the item on the left called the lapis niger black stone uh, was found under the early roman forum and it's uh, in archaic latin and it may be the earliest example of a uh, an inscription in latin the letters have a very much a, a greek uh, shape to them but it is archaic latin um, the item on the right is called the lapis satricanus and this is really uh, important in terms of what we're going to be talking about today. So this is a translation of what this inscription says. So dedicated this as the Sodalis of Publius Valerius to Mars. Uh, so what this is taken to mean by scholars is that um, Publius Valerius was a uh, was a leading head of a Roman clan or a Roman family. And what it demonstrates is uh, the establishment of, of um, what you kind of call a uh, condottieri. In other words, uh, aristocratic warlords whose power rested on support of personal dependents who were called clients or companions. So Adales is often translated as companions. So what we see here are uh, are uh, groups of people taking an oath. The suodalis comes, comes from the word, our word swear comes from suodalis. Uh, so we see here individuals taking an oath to be loyal followers of a leading aristocrat, Publius Marius, to Mars, which is to say, as warriors. Uh, so essentially these armed bands formed what were essentially private armies operating independently of state power, moving freely across state frontiers and frequently changing their alliances. They carried on private wars and this is attested very widely in the ancient sources. The third source for ancient Rome are literary texts. So we have the sources themselves, um, the three biggest ones Livy for, um, you know, for history per se, Livy, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, and Diodorus Siculus, they're called analysts, and I'll explain in a second why that is. Um, the second class are what were called antiquarians of the leading, leading one of which was Terentius Varro. These were people uh, in later Republican times in the Middle Republic who were interested in old stuff just for the sake of it being old. They weren't really historians but their findings were absolutely invaluable to modern historians because they weren't necessarily trying to tell a story. They didn't color their stuff. They just said, we found this, we found that, look at this. Uh, and they were very thorough and they're the source for all sorts of stuff that we don't know about from any other source. And then the others are, um, we have Polybius who is in many ways, the Roman equivalent of Thucydides uh, a scholar, from, a historian from that school of really reliable, uh, hard history. Cicero, who is a, a politician in the late Republic and an author uh, and wrote philosophical dialogues, which are uh, the source for a lot of information. And then Plutarch, Greg talked a lot about Plutarch. Plutarch is a, was a biographer and a moralist uh, in the, the uh, early, late first, early second century of the common era. So the point uh, of looking at these is to understand that these are all what modern people would call secondary sources. These are not original sources, but since they're the only sources we have, people think about them often as being uh, authoritative in the way that original sources are authoritative. And that's, that's, a, that's a big mistake made by modern, modern people and modern scholars because there's so little else to hang your hat on. You have to find something. Um, but 
Uh, the, the, the biggest point to make about this is that the, the memory of the historians really doesn't go back much, much past the 300s. So we're talking today about events in the 500s, 200 years, 250 years from when uh, these uh, people had uh, you know, extensive records to look at. So very frequently, someone asked, well, was Livy making things up and so forth and so on? Well, they weren't making things up, but they were looking at things anachronistically. So in other words, they had relatively good information about institutions in Rome in 300 and 350. So they would just project that back to 500 and 550 and just assume that what was true, I mean, and you know, to them, this 350 was, you know, 350 years before they were writing, a huge time ago. And the fact that there was another 250 years to go back, they would overlook that and just say, well, this is old. This must be what the ancient, you know, original Rome was like. Uh, and that's a real problem for modern scholars to uncover. Now, so modern scholars are very concerned with what they call, talk, call the, the sources of the sources. And the important ones are the Fasti. The Fasti were lists of consuls, and really not much more than that. They were just uh, the list of the two consuls, the two top magistrates that were elected every year in Rome. But they're an extremely important resource for historians uh, because just the existence of their names tells us a lot, uh, well, uh, allows people to. Uh, um, to theorize um, a lot about what's going on in ancient Rome. I'm going to talk just in a second about uh, Roman names, and you'll kind of see where that comes from. And then the second thing is the Annales Maximus. These are the annals. So the reason that the three historians, Livy, Dionysius, and Diodorus, are called analysts is because they relied heavily on these Annales Maximus. The Annales Maximus were... Uh, 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 notations that were made on a yearly basis that indicated uh, in very um, uh, brief mentions some of the major events that happened that in that year. So they would typically be things like um, the founding and dedication of temples, the victories in war, um, uh, other, uh, ex, you know, other expansion of, of works in the cities of, of, uh, this, of the, the walls and things like that. So um, that's why these, these sources are called analysts. They're, they're relying really heavily on these annals and the annals contain uh, um, absolutely useful historical information. And then there are some lost works. Fabius Pictor was the first known historian of Rome in the modern sense. So in a certain sense, he's just another secondary source, except that we don't have any of his writings surviving at all. And we do have constant references to Fabius in all of these other sources on the left. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, assume that these, I mean, we know that these people were, were, were consulting documents that no longer ex exist because they write about it. They say the following document was uh, deposited in, uh, in etched in bronze in, in such and such a temple, and I saw it. So um, we're assuming that they're not lying. Uh, and so it, it's a source of major information, Cato being another one who also wrote about this ancient world. OK. So, um, we talked a, a bit in the last lecture about um, the organization, the earliest organization of the city, which are uh, what is known as the Romulan tribes, because it, it would, in the sources, goes back to Romulus. Uh, of course, um, I think most scholars believe that Romulus is a completely legendary figure, uh, but the sources attribute this to Romulus, and it's the first division of the Roman people. Uh, they were divided into three tribes, given these names. Um, there's been a lot of scholarly ink 
trying to say, well, maybe these names represented ethnic groups or uh, they take it back to um, Indo-European uh, studies. Uh, but uh, I think modern scholars, the consensus is that, um, that, that uh, these were not ethnic groups at all. Uh, essentially what they were, were groups that were based on membership in a clan or called the Jeans or Gans, led by aristocrats. Okay, so these clans were groups of families. Uh, there, and understand that the families were not necessarily related, but and each family would have its own leader, the powder familias. Um, so it's it's not really good. It's not really um, correct to talk about clan leaders. There would be a group of clan leaders who would be the heads of the leading families in the clan. And so the point is that these tribes were composed on a clan basis, and then each of the tribes was divided into a, a grouping of ten curiae, uh, and that was the most early structure of Rome. Now, we talked, I'm, I said that these were based on Johns, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Roman names and, and how you recognize what these Roman names mean and how historians use them. Uh, and I've shown here two examples. The top, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, was the, uh, the victor over Carthage, uh, in the Second Punic War, the victor over Hannibal, the savior of Rome. Uh, the second is Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix. He was a dictator of Rome. Uh, he was uh, uh, in the in the first century BC, very much involved in the in the um, the war between the aristocrats and the uh, the the. Um, the uh, politicians who took support from the pop, the people who were called the popularis, um, but separated by uh, you know 150 years, the Roman name had basically these pieces. There were a few more in other special cases, but I won't get into it. You had a, a first name, the praenomen, uh, which is just used to distinguish between members of a family, just like our first name now. The only thing that's kind of remarkable about it is that the Romans had a very small inventory of personal names. So it gets very confusing because they use the names again and again and again and again and again. So sometimes it's difficult to understand which generation you're talking about. The second name called the nomen, which just means name, sometimes called the genticulum. I'm going back here. That's the word jaws, right? Um, so the, the nomen tells, tells someone what Johns this individual is a member of, a hereditary surname that identified a person as the member of a clan. And remember, it doesn't mean they're related. It means that they are in a, one, a member of a group of families that um, were essentially arbitrarily put together uh, to form these original tribes. It's the most important classification of Romans, and it is reason why you can study their names and see things about relationships between people who held office and so forth. The third name, and this is a, a, what uh, uh, Greg referred to as, as a nickname. Um, oh, it's it's not called, I, I, I misnabled, I, I mis mislabeled here, this is not the nomen. Um, uh, and I don't remember what it's actually called, but I'll have to look that up. I apologize. But it basically augments the second, second name, the, the nomen, to identify a particular branch within that family. So, um, so Scipio Africanus, which is the way he's usually referred to, and Sulla, the way that he's referred to, are two different branches of the Cornelii. Uh, and it was uh, initially a nickname, though later it became to represent, uh, as uh, in Hostilius, the uh, branch within the clan. But then the Romans added another name onto the end, 
uh, which would only be added for individuals that deserved it, called the cognomen. Uh, and that was based on something about that individual's life or accomplishments. So Africanus, he was the conqueror of Africa. And you see that, uh, that formula very often. If, if a Roman conquered some notable place, he would add that onto his name. So Numidicus, uh, um, uh, Asiaticus, uh, names of that sort, Hispanicus, uh, it was a way of just basically advertising to everybody how important they were and how amazingly fabulous their accomplishments were. And then Felix means lucky. Uh, and uh, so there was a, you know, the, uh, the father of, of the great Pompey, his, his, he was called Strabo, which means cross-eyed. Um, so uh, the Romans, uh, you know, they had a sense of humor. Uh, and it's reflected in, in, in their names. So this is the Curia based on their, their uh, hereditary uh, um, origin, being born into a family that's a member of a clan led by aristocrats. And I, that's why I wanted to show that thing in the beginning to, to show that these, these, uh, these families you know, were, were contained uh, large numbers of retainers who were private armies, essentially, and that's the nature of of, of this. So the the these these uh, tribes were uh, had an, a major aristocratic orientation because of this structure based on these family kinship. The clans in the Curia were not necessarily related, but they became uh, known by these clans, and they served for military, political, and uh, administrative functions. And this is how we reconstruct the relationship between these Romulan, Romulan tribes and the earliest form of the Roman army, which is basically that, that, that each tribe contributed a thousand industry, which is to say each curia uh, provided a hundred infantry and 10 cavalry. So from each tribe, a thousand infantry and a hundred cavalry, giving us the size of the original Romulan army of um, 3,000 infantry and uh, 300, cal uh, 300 cavalry. Now, we're going to see that these, the, the, one of the major things that that um, to, that the Servius Tullius did was to totally wipe out these Romulan tribes, uh, and to wipe out the the curiate assembly, which was the assembly of these tribes. Uh, but the Romans, as I said, this Roman conservative, Romans never threw anything out. They never discarded anything. They would just kind of move it sideways and change its functionality, but they would never get rid of it. So the names of these uh, Romulan tribes survived in the names of the cavalry, of the six original cavalry centuries. Century was originally represented, uh, you know, a hundred uh, soldiers, if you will. Uh, so there's the, the, um, the, the, preservation, the conservation, if you will, of the, of the Romulan tribes in the names of the later cavalry centuries. And then the uh, curiate assembly, the Comitia Curiata itself, actually continued to exist all the way through Republican times. Uh, Greg actually talked about how the curiate assembly was involved in, uh, in electing the emperor. Oh, I'm sorry, not the emperor, the one of the, the kings. Uh, and they no longer had that, that function later on, but they re retained some important functions. So they had religious functions, which I said were really critical to the Romans. Um, and then they had uh, a kind of a, people now look at it kind of like a rubber stamp of basically, even though they no longer uh, elected the king or the the highest magistrate, they they uh, had to pass a a law every year 
that conferred imperium, which is the power of command, on the magistrates who've been elected through other uh, assemblies. And we'll see that these assemblies were selected, were created by um, Servius Tullius. Paul? Yeah. Was kind of they were very traditional. I mean, when you say that they didn't discard anything, I mean well, they that, keep they were very traditional. They were both. So they were they were very traditional and they were very adaptive and flexible at the same time. So well, so this is the this is the traditional portion portion where mm -hmm. they they don't want to, you know, they, they won't say, okay. You know, it's like in the United States, we don't have, you know, we initially, the United States was organized in what was called the Articles of Confederation. We didn't have a Congress and <clears throat> we didn't have a president. We didn't have a constitution. Then when we replaced that and we have a constitution in, in, uh, in the United States, there were basically no remnants of the Articles of Confederation left. And that's, that's the real contrast with the Romans. The Romans would have taken the Articles of Confederation and they would not have gotten rid of it. They would have found some way to kind of move it sideways, uh, reflecting its uh, religious uh, functionality. And they would give it something to do so it never went away. That was Roman conservatism. So um, talking about um, Imperium, that the, the, the conferred Imperium what does that actually mean? Well, uh, Imperium was uh, really the power over, constitutional power over life and death. Uh, and these were the symbols of Imperium. The, the uh, one on the top here on the left are called the fascus. Uh, and this is the origin of the modern word fascism, but it's an unfortunate connotation because fascist and to, uh, in the modern world, implies uh, uh, oppressive dictator. You know, you think of the first thing you think of is Hitler and Mussolini. But uh, in Rome, the fasc the fascists were symbols of legitimacy. They were the symbols of constitutional power, uh, off uh, exercised through uh, elected magistrates. Um, and uh, the hey, picture Paul? on the yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, is there any particular symbolism about three of these, uh, is it Fasici? Um, uh, I never know how to pronounce it. Is there any particular um, uh, symbolism to, for three of them together as a unit? Well, okay, let, let, me, let me explain that. So what you look below, you see that there's this group of men carrying Fascus over their shoulders. Fascus, okay. Okay, yeah, that would be the, the Roman pronunciation, the, the Roman Latin pronunciation of it, fascus. Uh, and um, these people are, are called lictors, L-I-C-T-O-R-S. And they were, they preceded a magistrate and each of uh, the different magistrates who had, they, they were the symbol of imperium. And the magistrates were assigned different numbers of lictors, of lictors depending on how important their position was. So uh, the lowest level of Imperium, the Praetors, I think maybe had three or four. I think the Consuls had six or eight. And the, the highest level, which was a temporary position, but a constitutional position, was the dictator. And the dictator had 12 lictors. And they would precede the, the, the magistrate, uh, uh, basically was saying, here comes the magistrate and look out, people because he has the power of life and death. Uh, now, when you look at the picture of the fascus here and you see the ax blades, um, this was to show that um, outside the city of Rome, outside the sacred boundary of Rome called the Pomerium, the uh, holders of Imperium had the power of life and death over everybody, over Roman citizens, and over other people through their command of the Roman army. But inside the city, the ax heads were removed to show that inside the city, they could not arbitrarily uh, um, uh, order the execution of a Roman citizen without trial, without appeal. However, 
what the fascicus really are, uh, aside from the axes, are bundles of rods, which shows that they did have the power to order Roman citizens to be beaten. Uh, so you didn't really want to mess with the, you know, with, with the holders of imperium. Well, the, the right. reason I the reason I ask is the the, the fascists uh, when, um, uh, put three of them together as a symbol to, on their airplanes, and so I thought maybe th three of them together was something symbolic. But I don't think so. I think that's a, that's devised by the, the the modern fascists. Thank you. But if we look at George Washington, so what is he leaning on? He's leaning on Fascus, right? He's leaning on the bundle of rods. And he's a great example of, of, of a man who exercised power, who commanded the armies, and did it in a constitutional way, right? That's really key. Look at the look at the, the arms of the chair that Lincoln is sitting on. Did the Faskis always have an axe? I notice I can't see an axe on George Washington. As, as I said, the fat the axe was only there when the magistrate went outside of the city. Oh, okay. So his authority, and, his ability to hurt you was limited then. Okay. That's right. In this yep. in, inside the city, Roman citizens had the right of appeal. Uh they had they you could not condemn a Roman citizen to death without without legal um due process which obviously this is this is where we got that by the way this is where we get the modern concept of due process and there were you know roman consuls who violated that and they suffered for it uh sometimes with being convicted uh and executed sometimes by sent being sent into exile or sometimes forcing them to uh you know kind of uh, have a, a coup d'etat and take over the state to avoid the consequences of having violated, uh, you know, the 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 law by executing citizens without trial. Cicero is a good example of that. Okay, so symbols of imperium. So now, Servius Tullius, the second founder of Rome. What did he do? Well, the first thing he did is he totally got rid of uh, the Romulan tribes as a way of organizing the entire Roman people. Uh, and as I said, the tribes had this aristocratic orientation because they were family groups led by the heads of those groups. And you entered one of these uh, tribes only by birth. It was called Genticular, the, jo the Johns. And, uh, Servius replaced them with tribes that were organized on a geographic basis. So he had four urban tribes within the city of Rome itself. And then he had some number of rural tribes. And these, there's a lot of scholarly debate over how many there were and originally and when they were added to, but ultimately there were 31 rural tribes, a total of 35 tribes. And tribes were added as Rome conquered more territory. And uh, then they, they would add new tribes and until they reached a certain point and they realized that they couldn't keep going with it uh, and they stopped creating new tribes. Uh, but the, the key thing here is that they now broke through the family affiliations and you are now became a member of a tribe based on where you lived. This, by the way, is very similar to um, the, the reforms of, of Cleosthenes in Athens, who did uh, before this, or maybe around the same time, did pretty much, uh, pretty much the same idea of, of organizing people into uh, uh, localities, which basically breaks the power of the aristocracy and creates a notion of citizenship across different groupings, right? So this is really an important thing. Then the second thing that he did is he created something known as the centuriate system. Now this creates a really difficult historical problem and I'm gonna spend most of the rest of this presentation talking about this. So the, one of the things that, that Servius did was he created the census. And initially uh, it wasn't, they, it, it took a while before they created an official name, the censor, who took the census, 
but Servius took, created the, the idea of, of doing a regular census every five years. Rome was unique in the ancient world. Other uh, civilizations had census, but only Rome repeated it on a regular and repeated basis and used it to basically reclassify and essentially refound, if you will, the state. After every five year period, they would change the way they classified the citizens. So we know about this from Livy and Dionysius. And uh, if we look on the right, this is what Livy and Dionysius told us. They tell us, first of all, that the, the centurion system designed as, as a way of organizing the army. And the centurion system is, is frequently referred to as the nation in arms, the people in arms, or the, the soldiers assembly, if you will. And so Livy and Dionysius uh, talked about how the, the, the census would divide all the citizens into five classes. Now, there's more than this. I haven't talked about the cavalry, which are kind of, which are above this property rating, and there are other uh, um, classifications for musicians and engineers, uh, and it just makes it much more complicated. So I'm going to focus on this, which is the mass of the citizens. So you had these five classes based on property. Uh, an ass represented a pound of bronze. And the items that are in square braces is where there's a difference between uh, Dionysius and Livy, right? The square bracket is what Dionysius said, and otherwise it's either what they agreed upon or what Livy said. Uh, and then you see that, that, that both of them, both Livy and Dionysius, because they knew that this was associated with, uh, with an organization of the army, they said, well, okay, then there must be a, a way of distinguishing in these classes based on what they did in the army. So they assigned defensive armament to them and offensive armament to each of the classes. And then they talked about how many centuries were organized from each of these classes. And as you see, the centuries themselves were organized into uh, two different types of centuries, uh, ionores, that means junior centuries, and seniores, senior centuries. So the junior centuries were people up through age 45, and the seniors were age 46 and older, giving you the totals that we show um, on the bottom here. Now, um, this is uh, the Servian system as presented to us by these authorities. And it served as the structure of the army, they said, but really? When we look at it, we see that that's actually impossible. It's impossible for demographic reasons and it's impossible for social reasons. In other words, if you're gonna take the, the, the richest, most exclusive section of the population here, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna say exclusive because these are not the cavalry, so uh, these are not necessarily senators. Uh, they're rich farmers, they're affluent people that can, uh, but there's no way that they are supplying um, 80 centuries compared to basically equal to everybody else in the population put together. It just doesn't happen like that. There's no way, you know, in a, from a da demographic point of view that you could have these numbers make any sense. And it's also no, no way for them to make sense in terms of young people and old people, because especially in the conditions of the ancient world, you'd have to figure that the, 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 if you look at the population based on age 45, it would probably be a ratio of maybe four to one of people 45 and, and younger compared to people 46 and older. So there's no way that this actually could have been a workable division for uh, for the Roman army. So what was it? How do we look at this? So the first thing to do is to look at these, this description of the defensive arm and um, understand, as I, as I said before, that, that Livy and um, Dionysius were looking at conditions in, you know, around years 350 to 300, the Middle Republic, 
uh, and using them to describe things that happened in, in 550 BC, 200, 250 years before. And uh, so the idea of attributing specific defensive pieces of armor, well, these guys had greaves and these guys didn't, and these had a round shield and these had an oblong shield. That's historical nonsense. That's the these historians, you know, burning the midnight oil and trying to say, well, he told us that it's the army and we have these classes and how can we make some sense of it? So there's no way that this is actually historically accurate. However, it does point us to something which is really gives us a kind of a clue towards what this really meant, how this reflects something that, that Servius Tullius did, which is, if you notice, the three top property classes are all equipped as heavy infantry. They are all people, and we're, we're, we're assuming at this point in history that the Roman military system was based on the Greek phalanx. We know that this is true because we see Greek hoplite armor and weapons appearing in Roman and other Italian graves starting in the seventh century. Uh, and we see so many different, ex and we see examples of illustrations of the phalanx. So the point is that you have, it's much more meaningful to think that in the, the earliest census, what they really wanted to find out is who was capable of functioning in the phalanx as heavy infantry, could furnish their own weapons and do that, and who couldn't, who was too poor to do that. And they would be light infantry, what the Roman called, Romans called velites. And you see that reflected that they were using missile weapons, javelins, stones, and, so, and, and slings. Uh, so this starts to actually make some sense in terms of what would be a sensible military organization based on wealth class in the time of of this uh you know early regal period so Paul, yeah a question and in, in the other uh, the other chart um class one and two will be very minimum in comparison to the other classes in terms of population in terms of population and that's what i meant when i said that it's demographically impossible right so you're going to take the richest group and say that they they supplied 80 centuries and then everybody else combined only supplies 90 centuries so you're saying just about half of the army comes from the richest people that's impossible that's what i meant right Right, but also that everybody's armed. I mean, if you have 100 people that is in the lower class and you have only one pe one person in the upper class, why you will obey? Well, let me just say that, that the, the one class that is not included in this list are what was called the proletariat, which is a Roman word. And the proletariat were, were those who were not, who had basically no property at all. They couldn't make even the minimum property rate. They couldn't supply themselves with weapons. They couldn't function in the army okay. at all. Okay. And those yeah. people were totally disenfranchised. Okay. That's what I was. Right. Okay. They, they were not, they, they didn't matter. They had absolutely no political significance. They had no military significance. Later on, they did. And it's also assumed that at this point in history, there weren't very many of them because the society was overwhelmingly agrarian, overwhelmingly agricultural. So most of these people were farmers. And even these, these richer people, um, you know, they, 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 had, they didn't have huge plantation farms. They'd have farm hands <coughs> and they would be slaves, but they would be very involved, uh, you know, in, in their own agriculture. Um, okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. essentially what, what we were, and this is, this is Cornell's uh, uh, reconstruction here. He's saying, okay, so really what you have is you have a division of the people who are eligible to serve into two, two groups, hoplites, heavy, heavy infantry, and velites, light infantry. And then you have a field army with this number of, his, of centuries. However, we know that the, because of the, the age disparity, 
uh, that the field army will be four times as big as the home army, which also makes sense. And this ratio of 60 heavy infantry to 25 velites um, corresponds to the, the, uh, what the sources say was the, the approximate division of, uh, of arms in the earliest Roman legions. So now we see what, how the, the, the wealth classes actually function. How do you work these, uh, these local, local geographic tribes into the system? Because they were very much part of this system. How do you get to getting 60 centuries of hoplites? How do you divide them across these tribes? You know, do you get some number of centuries from each tribe? Well, that doesn't work because that would imply that all the tribes are the same size. They're not the same size. And what would happen when you add a new tribe? Are you going to reorganize all the centuries? Are the centuries, it, it, would, it's, it, it can't be, you can't make sense of this by assuming that, uh, that the, the centuries were, uh, you know, centuries two through eight come from this tribe and then nine through 12. It doesn't make any sense if you do that. Well, what does make sense? Well, first, we have the tribes coming in here, and we're showing that the tribes are very much a part of this system, right? And from each tribe, they're going to have people that are going to be categorized by whether they can supply themselves to be heavy or light infantry. And uh, some of the earliest, um, some of the sources uh, talk about these using the word classis and infraclassum. So classes means the class, and infraclass means under the class. So this came to mean something later, but the, the concept that, that uh, um, Cornell is advancing is that the, at this point in time, the classes is, is equivalent with the heavy infantry. So how do you make sense of the tribal division? Well, basically think of it like this. If you have 60, if you want to get 60 centuries of heavy infantry, you divide each tribe into 60 groups of equal size. Then you have each tribe is then contributing some number of men to each century. So you end up having the centuries be a complete cross section of all the tribes for that wealth class, and they're of uniform size, and you can add new tribes into this system very easily. It doesn't, you don't have to reorganize anything. And uh, it also gives you ways of having a flexible method of conducting the military draft based on how many soldiers you need at any one time. So you say, well, you know, let's say the, the, the whole army makes up um, 6,000 infantry. Well, but we only need 2,000 infantry. So it means that we can basically take one third of the tribes and say, okay, this year, one third of the tribes are going to provide uh, members for the army. And we know that this is, that they did this because the sources talk about how the consuls then raised uh, troops for this or that military based on the number of tribes. So basically, what we've shown here is, is how to make sense of this, that this, this is the original Servian reform. And I'll add that this group had, in addition to this military function, this organizational function, okay, and remember, recreated every five years by a new census. Um, it also had a political function. So the, the choosing of the king that happened originally in the, in the Curiate Assembly, the Comita Curiata, now passed to the Centuriate Assembly. The, cent, the cent, centuries now elected the, the king. And later, and this happened all through the Republic, they elected the consul. And they also elected the, the praetor. Um, 
So this was the most important assembly that elected the top magistrates of the Republic. And oh, yeah. Quick question. So uh, this was for uh, providing uh, for the army, providing, uh, but were they like kind of taxes too? They have to, these families have to pay in produce or do something? I'm, I'm, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that the, the, the notion that scholars has is that at this early time, there was, there was no, no specific taxes where regular taxes were levied on the people. Because if they have a control of, if they have such a great census, they can know, I mean, a, a little bit like the Egyptians, they knew they have all these people counting and saying, okay, you have so much land, you are supposed to give us whatever, you, your granaries are this. Do they use that too, or well, remember that these soldiers had to support themselves, right? So let's actually you 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 gave me a great going into the final piece here. So there was a time, uh, and the the sources uh, put this at. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm missing the day, but it's in, in the 300s, in the, in the mid 300s, there was a, or the, the early, the early 300s, there was a, a, a reform, a set of, whole set of reforms that were passed that affected the army. One of them was that soldiers should be paid. And, uh, had never happened before. And this kind of coincides with the point that Rome started really aggressively conquering their neighbors and using the fruits of their conquest to pay the soldiers and to build temples and, and monuments in Rome. Um, it was also the time of the replacement of the hoplite phalanx by what was known as the manipular military system. And we'll talk about that later, but it was a huge change. And um, what it basically meant is that this is the point where the political function of the Centurion Assembly became entirely separated from the military function of the, of the Assembly. And we get to a point where this now actually makes sense. So the military function no longer exists for the Centurion Assembly at all. At this point, what the sources show us is that um, the the army would be just um, uh, uh, recruited tribe by tribe, and what would essentially happen is that the military tribunes would go into each tribe, and then they would cast lots, and then would choose um, for each legion members of that tribe, uh, and then they move on to the next. Um, so they had essentially a, a ball and then they would know some you know these would be heavy infantry these would be live uh, light infantry and they no longer needed the census in order to tell them how to organize the army however they continued to they they then took this as a way of creating some uh, tremendous political um constitutional definition of what rome was so um 409, 406 BC began to pay the soldiers. Okay, so uh, we talk about one one uh, sense of contradictions: the the conservatism and the flexibility. So I think this illustrates really extremely innovative flexibility of how to organize your state so that you could be expanding your territory, expanding your population bringing people in from outside and you have a way of organizing them so that they contribute to the army and uh and and they become incorporated into the the state uh in a meaningful way um at the same time we saw we had the survival of the 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 previous uh, uh curiate assembly but here once we had this uh, this change in 406 well, the other big contradiction in looking at, at Rome is the question of fundamentally was what was Rome? Was Rome 
democratic or was Rome oligarchic or was Rome a monarchy? Well, we know it wasn't a monarchy. The Romans took huge pains to, uh, you know, the, the, the Roman uh, hatred of kings was nothing like it any, anywhere in the ancient world. Uh, but we see that on the one hand, you have these institutions that look kind of basically democratic. You know, you have people from many different property classes. And let's say, okay, yes, indeed, it was only men. Uh, and it was only free men. And it was only free men who had a minimum property classification. So it's certainly not democratic in the way that we would look at this today. But this was pretty democratic for the ancient world. Uh, really amazingly so. At the same time, people have a feeling that Rome really wasn't a democracy. It was really an oligarchy. So how was that? So now look at these numbers and all of a sudden the centuries start to make sense. So these are the centuries given to us by Livy and Dionysius. And if we think of them in the centurion assembly, you voted by centuries, not by numbers of people. So the winner of an election in the centurion assembly was whoever got the votes of the most centuries. So we see that that the that class one had more centuries than anybody else, almost as much as everybody else put together. And furthermore, that old people had as had four, you know, based on on their population, had four times as much representation as young people. So we see that what the Romans have managed to do here is to create a political structure which tremendously favors the rich and tremendously favors old people over young people. So you have a, a, a system which has certain democratic elements for it. It does have elections and elections were contested. They weren't just rubber stamped, but within that, the, 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 uh, the rich people and the old people had disproportionate uh, uh, power. Uh, and so once again, I, I hope that this gives you some sense of the, the kind of contradictions in Rome, how it could be so many things at the same time and how practical and pragmatic it was at the same time as being conservative and actually out, downright superstitious. Uh, and so this is, um, yeah, so in the mature centurion assembly, they elected the, 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 um, the magistrates, the officials that had imperium, that had the ability to command life and death, disproportionate representation for the richest, disproportionate representation for the oldest. And that is my presentation. Wow, <clears throat> that's great. That was very, very interesting. Thank you, Paul. This yeah. is uh, yeah. and thank you, Greg. You guys. Yeah, that was good. Interesting. Oh, yeah, and hopefully this will motivate people to uh, join us in presenting because we're missing. You know, uh, thank you for Marika and Aaron stepping up all the time, Greg. Uh, Benson, Babu, if you want to step up and do a presentation, or Fred or um you know howard you said you're gonna think about it let me know because you seem to know a lot of stuff and this is this is good that's how we share information so yeah, thank uh, you all things yeah, great really appreciate it yeah it was good. thank you so much guys and uh so just uh you know again this was a great um continuation of our roman topic and on like i said saturday is completely reserved to rome and it's going to be rome for up until we get to probably Byzantium for maybe a, a year and a half or two years easy on Saturdays. So that's why we reserve Sundays to other topics that interest you and Wednesdays and Thursdays. So let me know what, you know, what topics you wanted to discuss, but Saturday is reserved to Rome. All roads lead to Rome, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, thank you again, Greg, and I'll post the videos today again. And uh, anybody have any questions for Greg or Paul? Uh, no, Zach, this is a general question. This is uh, Ben Babu. 
I'm, I'm trying to, I would love to present, and I don't know how the, the system works with regards to figuring out a topic and dividing the time to do so. So is there a, a system set in place that I, do I email you or? Yeah, you just email me uh, and I'll post my email right now. Uh, you know, and then you just say, listen, I'm interested in such and such topic, either ancient, medieval, or any other history or even present topics. Um, anything that interests you, like this is my email. Okay. Uh, and let me say that, that what we try to do with, with, with Rome, I mean, we, the, the idea of this group is to have a number of different simultaneous threads going, because we don't want to get, you know, too bogged down in any one area and bore people. So we have this, uh, what you might think of as a chronological ancient history thread, uh, which had started in the ancient Near East. And we went through um, uh, you know, Sumer and Akkad and Babylonia and, and uh, the Bronze Age and that. And then we went through Greece and now we're gonna go through Rome. So uh, a few of us sat down and tried to come up with a, uh, an outline of what were the major topics that we want to cover in that. And that is in Zach's spreadsheet. And so you can, if you want to, you can, you know, you can volunteer to do presentations in that, um, you know, in that kind of curriculum, if you will, that that's laid out there, but understand that it's, it's flexible. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a guideline, but it's not cutting granite and so forth. And then we have these other areas that we've been running at the same time, which are just kind of other things that people are, are interested in uh, all across the board, uh, which has been modern history, medieval history, uh, all different parts of the world. Um, so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the other side of what the group does. And also just wanted to mention that we have this uh, ancient text thing uh, and the next uh, one I will be presenting uh, Dion uh, from Full Park. And the reason I, I chose this because uh, I thought that we kind of uh, missed it in, in Greek uh, uh, presentations because this is really about the dynasty of Dionysus, uh, uh, Dionysus in Syracuse and uh, Dionysus older and Dionysus second younger. And Dion was associated with both of them. And this period uh, in history, we didn't cover that well. Dion, like a very interesting figure. Of course, it's also involved uh, uh, Plato, who tried to educate the uh, Dionysius II. Uh, uh, so it's a very fascinating period that I think we did not cover in our Greek. It's kind of like a timeline. So that's something that Plutarch wrote about. So right, and so the, the ancient one. the ancient history is, happens on use. I mean, the idea is that that's the Wednesday. 12 o'clock and then the the other saturday, history saturday, saturday that's i'm sorry that's the saturday 12 o'clock and then the other history is sunday four o'clock right and then this ancient text that, that that greg is talking about is um wednesday at seven o'clock right. and sometimes there are presentations on thursday yeah thursday we we usually choose either the interesting uh personalities or interesting subject matters like, for example, we talk about, uh, like, uh, for example, Paul presented on metal, metal, metallurgy in ancient world. It was, was a really incredible presentation and very niche, uh, and everybody enjoyed. Then we had Anne presenting on parasailing and sailing in Cup of America. Uh, we are doing the FIFA World Cup. And this, you know, I talk, there's one of the very popular videos that people are laughing at me, sex in the ancient world. We went from... Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and we talked about, you know, how, I mean, it wasn't anything nasty, but we talk about homosexuality in ancient Rome and Greece and, you know, Egypt, and, and it's, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't doing it justice, and there's a thousand views right now in it over three months, you know, just like Paul says, sex sells, you know? <laughs> sorry. But, uh, you know, obviously not, not everybody's cup of tea, but if you want to talk about slavery in Rome, talk particularly about women being sold uh, and even Bestalkas, you know, what, whatever you guys want to present, doesn't matter. Um, let me know if it's sexy, if it's interesting, or if it's just interesting. We, we're here all to, to really do it in depth analysis and um, type of thing. And again, 
Uh, everybody is on, you know, different wavelengths and want to do different things. Don't feel pressure that you have to do it in a certain format. You, you know, you, whatever format you choose, as long as you have a presentation up and maps, you know, you're good to go. And uh, if you want to, you know, uh, however you want to present it, even if you have a video that you want to play for about, you know, two to five minutes, uh, not longer than that, because people get bored. That would be right. interesting as well. Yeah. So typically for the presenters that have, presented in this group, how long does it usually take for prep time? It depends. I mean, some of the ones it may take like Anne and Lisa and, you know, Paul and Greg, they usually, they, they like to have some time to, you know, sit down and think like about it. Some of the presenters it's already up, presented. It's up to you really, whatever yeah. time you need. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, it, do you have some subject that you're interested in? And then maybe no, I, really, I really, yeah, I just I'm trying to carve out some time in terms of you know, what the group, I just wanted to get a good sense on how long a, a presentation for like an hour, hour and a half or two hours would take at that depth. So I can carve out that time to dedicate the time for it. That's all. So and let me just say that you, you don't have to feel compelled that you're, you're going to have to talk for the whole two and a half hours for yourself. Because, I mean, for example, Greg and I are going to collaborate on a few of these presentations, uh, you know, uh, where um, so so neither of us is is looking at presenting a two hour presentation. Uh, okay. And it makes it, you know, easier for us to prepare. And I think it creates more variety for the audience. Yeah, no, I really enjoy this group. Really. Oh, well, thank you for uh, participating. Yeah. You're, you're a regular. Appreciate that, and everybody. Yeah, it's great. Mikhail, you know, uh, Howard recent joined, but you know, everybody. Thank you. You know, Fred. You know, and uh, Marika, Mark, Aaron. You know, you guys are amazing, and uh, appreciate it. And always uh, have very constructive. Um, you know. Uh, comments and stuff like that and improving our group and now you know we even getting together i don't know where you live uh uh manhattan where manhattan, manhattan. Okay, so maybe we can join for our one of our dinner you know you can see everybody yeah. in the group, you know? yes uh, i'm in the murray hill area too, in that region okay yeah, so hill, i'm in yeah. toronto canada <laughs> uh, well, we'll, we'll come to you too i mean we're we're yeah, yeah. Something we wanted to do in different cities, you know. We I want to go to. Uh, there was a person that expressed they want to go to Washington, get together in Washington, and then you know, me why me why do Toronto? It's not that far, you know. We're it's in, not. Uh, I have to check and see how locked down we are at the moment. I'm hoping there's a barber open. Yeah, my, uh, <laughs> my, my brother-in-law open. You know, has a bus company, so I'll just load everybody up and we'll go. To Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, don't Sounds worry. Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I wanted to create where we, you know, we have a lot of fun together. You know, it's not going to be just, you know, uh, we, and let's say also I wanted to do a poll, maybe not right now, but um, in maybe in a month, let's get together uh, for a history presentation one time. So, uh, mm -hmm. like we used to get together, you know, uh, we'll face to face. As a face, you know. The problem is, I'm trying to figure out how to include the Zoom audience because some of the people on the West Coast. So it's difficult. Yeah, that's. We tried that uh, uh, once in another group, and uh, it's not working very well because people at the table uh, they they don't hear that well. Somebody on the the other side of the table on the computer, yeah, it's kind of uh, difficult. Uh, that, but maybe we should alternate. Just I tell you, are you trying to find a quiet bar? We went to yeah, the that's bar. A real problem. We went to the, too. Yeah, went to the yeah. bar, and uh, you know there were like like maybe seven or eight of us, and then we have a bunch of people on Zoom. Uh, on the, we brought the computer yeah. in, and uh, uh, and they no. were talking. But uh, the thing is that uh, you know it's not, and that was a book uh, discussion, so everybody talked. It's not like it's a presentation. Yeah. You know, so uh, it was a little bit difficult because it's hard to hear uh, for the people who are away from the computer, uh, considering that in the bar sometimes there are some other noises. It's tough. You have to. I play in a trivia league, and I was quiz master for a couple seasons in at one of the bars, and it was noisy. And my yeah. horror throughout that period was that I would ask a question, and somebody sitting in sitting in the seat behind us would answer it. 
And I think it only happened <laughs> yeah, so, once. Yeah, you, you, you um, get, uh, yeah, you get um, uh, other participations. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, um, I, I, I think in the end, hmm. Zoom has proven to be really the best way to organize these type of presentations. Yeah, and then I think absolutely. when it comes to getting together in person, those should just be more like fun, yeah. social yeah. kind of gatherings i mean with a history topic a maybe idea. but just sort sure. of bsing and then because because right. right. this model really yeah. you know the allows thing, other, for everybody yeah. to really participate yeah, I, I agree i agree yeah it, it looks like yeah that's why what uh, you know zach uh, organizing in july i mean uh, this is more like for fun maybe have a few well, drinks I'm, and yeah. uh, you could uh, by the way bring your own bottle there in that restaurant well the other thing uh, yeah, the other thing I do with the bars, I think, is pay attention and look for bars with party rooms or separate rooms. The history yeah. meetup I got into with Toronto with, with James, um, it's a bar on Danforth, and it's got a little room, at the, it's kind of an Irish bar, and it's got a little room at the front, and we're in there, and there's, it's actually really quiet. It works very well. In the Trivia League I'm playing, our home bar, we've actually got our own room. There's a fair bit of noise coming in from outside, but we can cope. Um, well, but, the key, yeah. The key here, though, is that you have to buy booze and food. You have to buy alcohol. Well, no, but I mean, I, I think even more basic than that is that the way, and I've seen this at work, right? The way these tools frame mm -hmm. um, the conversation. Um, I mean, like we we're supposed to, at work, we're supposed to have a workshop this Thursday. And, you know, and it was sort of like, a, like 60% of people could, could go to Atlanta. I mean, like, not just because like of COVID, it's just like a logistics.